uh, finish our introduction to linear models uh, today, uh, paving the way to next week when we talk about multiple regression. It'll be the, ordinary, the same sort of models we have here, uh, but with more stuff in them. Um, so uh, the signals I'm getting uh, from people asking questions about homework are that you guys are, first of all, really good at this. Uh, your problems are pretty minor, and you have and the anticipated sort of problems. And I want to highlight one that's, that's common and always happens in the first couple weeks of this course and is a symptom not of any failing on your part, but just uh, it, it's a symptom of the fact that words mean different things in different contexts. And most people here have probably not had a Bayesian stats course before, and unfortunately Bayesian statistics uses words from statistics in general and means different things by them. Uh, confidence interval is a classic example of that. Bayesian confidence intervals should not be interpreted the same way as, as non-Bayesian confidence intervals. I mentioned that before. Um, even innocent words like sampling. Uh, you did a bunch of sampling in your homework. You enjoyed it, right? It was fun. And uh, one thing I just want to highlight for you is that you know your, your previous education can, can impede learning because it puts up an obstacle. And that obstacle is purely historical. It's just a side effect of your development educationally up to this point, like the Great Wall of China, which is why it's pictured here. right? It's not actually meant to stop people from getting from keep Mongolians out of the country anymore. <laughs> this is the historical obstacle. And your prior education in frequentist statistics is just a historical obstacle right now to your uh, full embodiment of the Bayesian uh, approach. Uh, but you'll work through it. You'll eventually climb over this wall. And uh, so I just want to highlight for you here, in, in frequentist statistics, uh, sampling typically means uh, resampling the data in in imagination, we imagine resampling the data. We imagine alternative data sets. And from each of those, we get an estimator of some kind, whether like the sample mean. And that you collect a bunch of those, a very large number of those, and you get a distribution called the sampling distribution. And that distribution is used to characterize the uncertainty in the estimator you have from the data you did observe. Uh, we don't do this in Bayesian statistics, uh, even though we use the word sampling. So in this class, almost all the sampling we're going to do, and we will do a lot. Oh, yes, you've just gotten started. Uh, there will be a lot of sampling. It's just to do, integra do integrals. It's a way of getting collections of things so we can calculate areas under a curve. That's almost all the sampling we do. We don't resample data. We'll, re we'll sample parameter values, and almost all the stuff you're sampling will be that. Occasionally, we do uh, sample observations, but and you did this in the posterior predicted checks. Um, and that's much closer in spirit to what you've done in, in prior statistical work. Uh, but we're not resampling our data. We're imagining forecasting, in a sense, and looking at the implications of the model uh, through that. So it's a way to simulate data, um, uh, but it's not resampling the actual data. So if you didn't, you know, maybe this wasn't, this little sermon wasn't a value to you, in other words, great. But uh, if it was, you're perfectly normal, because it's just a fault of the pedagogy that these same words are used over and over again. Um, that's why we do mathematical notation. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight for you. Uh, this will be one of the obstacles that arises, and it's just a semantic obstacle, and you'll get past it. Um, this is where we left off before. This is the first linear regression we're working with. I'm going to restate the model at the top. Uh, we have heights of individuals indexed i, and we say that those observations, those individual heights, uh, we expect them to be normally distributed with some mean i that is conditional on the individual i. Uh, in some standard deviation sigma, which is not conditional on individuals. And that's, there's no reason, I uh, wanted to say this last time, uh, but I forgot, I'll say it now, there's no reason that has to be true. You can make sigma conditional on I as well. And in fact, at the end of the course, we're, all the action, we're going to look at a class of models called Gaussian processes, where all the action is there in the sigma, so to speak. We model the covariance structure among observations. Uh, and everything, all the cool stuff happens there. So phylogenetic regression is like that. It's a class, it's an example of that kind of thing, where all the actions in the covariance structure, you model the covariation. Um, for most of the course, though, there'll just be little old sigma there, and it's pretty inert and boring, uh, just like that. It's not conditional on anything. Um, the definition of how the mean mu sub i is conditional on uh, the individual i is contained in the second line. This is the linear model part of the regression model. Um, it's an equation for a line with intercept alpha and slope beta, and x sub i, where x is the weight of individual i. Uh, then we define priors. I'm going to say a little bit more about priors as we go, and, and again, I, I'll bring up this horoscope issue that I brought up before. Um, 
in this case, we have a broad, very effectively flat prior on the intercept alpha, uh, a very slightly conservative prior on the slope beta centered on zero. Why? Because zero means no effect, right? Uh, now, I wanted to say when we get here, this is still a pretty silly prior. You can easily do better because you know the relationship between height and weight is positive, right, prior to seeing the data. Uh, so if you constrained uh, the estimate of beta to be positive, you would learn faster from the same amount of data. Right, so a, a robot that had a prior for beta that was strictly positive would learn faster. Right, it would converge to the right answer quicker than this ignorant robot that has no idea that the association between height and weight is positive or not. Right, it's like we're estimating it as precisely as we can, and the question is how quickly can you do that with a finite amount of data? Um, but this is a very typical kind of uh, conservative prior, uh, and uh, there's so much data here that these priors get completely swamped by everything. But I'll get you a question in a second. And then this uniform prior on sigma. Uh, you fit this with uh, quadratic, you know, quadratic approximation for the posterior distribution implied by this model and these data uh, with the R code uh, displayed here, translating uh, the model lines into the, that list. Question? How would you do that, do the positive priors thing with this group, or is that complicated? Um, it's not complicated. The question was, uh, how would I do that, put a positively constrained prior on beta here? You can use a distribution that's constrained to be positive. Uh, uh, so uh, there are a large, there are a large number of those actually um, that you can choose, and we'll use it, we'll see examples of those later on. In fact, I was going to say something about this on the next slide. Actually, um, the standard deviation sigma must be positive, so that's a parameter that has to have a prior <coughs> that's strictly positive. So uh, uh, you could use a uniform, right? You could say that the um, prior for beta is uniform between 0 and 50. And then we're saying it can't be negative, and it's probably not bigger than 50 because, seriously, <laughs> right? Uh, and that would probably be OK. That's the simplest way. There are a bunch of uh, so-called folded distributions, which are constrained to be positive, like a folded Cauchy. And we're going to use that, or say a half Cauchy, sometimes it's called. We're going to use that later on in the course, uh, mainly for sigma, so-called scale parameters. Um, and those work great in those sorts of contexts. Uh, OK, so yeah, I wanted to give you some, some what I call horoscopic advice on regression uh, priors. And again, I say this just to say this is the, the most solid, vague advice I can give you before I know what you're actually doing scientifically. <laughs> Once you tell me what you're doing scientifically, I can almost certainly do better than this. Right? So it's like the horoscope. When you read the horoscope, that person who wrote it doesn't actually know you, and they don't actually do magic with planets. So it's, they give vague advice that fits everybody's life, and that's why it's so satisfying to read horoscopes in the newspaper, right? Because it always speaks to you as a person. Uh, these priors, I hope, will speak to you as a person. And then, nevertheless, you can always do better than this, right? So for intercepts and linear regressions, the alpha parameters, as I'm going to show you later today, those can swing around very wildly depending upon the slopes and the locations of particular values in your data. So it's hard to have a strong prior expectation of where those are. So the most general useful advice I can give you um, unless you do something like standardize all your predictors, which is something I'll show you how to do later, uh, later today, in fact, uh, you don't know where it's going to be, so give it a, an essentially flat prior. And that's why I'm using those things with like a standard deviation of 100. That's essentially a flat line over any reasonable range of parameter values. Um, and that, So alpha ends up having being an unconstrained estimate. It can go swing around wherever. Beta then drives it. And it affects where the line is. If you change the slope on a line, you also change the intercept. Uh, and the slope is our, is our curiosity. Um, these uh, uh, Gaussian uh, slope priors centered on zero are conservative. Uh, you want to scale them so that they rule out really silly things like, <coughs> like uh, uh, outrageously strong association between height and weight. And that will depend upon your domain knowledge. Um, this will make more sense to you when we get to chapter six. We call these priors regularizing. Um, it's better to use a conservative prior because it dampens down a phenomenon called overfitting. And you're just going to have to be patient until we get to chapter six, and then there'll be a ton of examples of that. It'll make sense. Uh, this is, again, my, my mission to convince you that flat priors are never the best priors. In this case, there's so much data. We've got over 500 individuals that even a quite strong prior on this will be completely overwhelmed. And I'm not going to demonstrate that in class, but I really do encourage you to do that experiment yourself. How do you do it? You just change the number in the standard deviation of the prior and play around with different ones and see how small you have to make uh, the standard deviation on beta before it starts changing your estimate of the slope. You're going to have to make it really small, like 0.1. Uh, 
uh, which is a really concentrated. That'll put all the probability mass right over zero, essentially. And then you'll start to nudge it off where it was before because you have so much data. Um, and I'll, I'll, as the course goes on, I'll give you more and more ways to understand uh, these things. When you have small amounts of data, though, that's when you really need the prior to do some work so that the model doesn't get overexcited by the time you announce the data present. And in chapter six, um, I'll deliver more on the promise of understanding that. Scale parameters like sigma, sigma is a standard deviation. It scales a distribution, right? Stretches it out. Uh, and in statistics, there are a bunch of these sorts of parameters. They're not always standard deviations, but they scale a distribution. They stretch it out horizontally. Um, these are scale parameters are, are nearly always constrained to be positive real numbers, and um, or I should say non-negative real numbers. Uh, the, it's nearly always harmless to use a uniform prior like we're doing uh, between zero and some upper bound that is within rational reason, and that's an easy thing to do. Later on, we're going to want to regularize these as well, make them conservative to shrink estimates towards zero a little bit. And I'll, that's when I'll introduce you to these folded distributions that uh, I mentioned, like the, the half Cauchy. Uh, or an exponential is a really good one, too. Um, you may know exponentials, but if you don't, that's okay. I'll, I'll show you how that works when we get there. I'll just say this is the vaguest advice I can give you that I think is mostly harmless. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, you fit that model that was on two slides back, and uh, here's the uh, Precy output for it, just showing you the, the, the values that define the marginal posterior distribution of each parameter, uh, alpha, sigma, and beta uh, here, uh, means and standard deviations of them, as well as um, percentile intervals, the 95% percentile intervals for you. Uh, this uh, is just about the last time we'll be able to peer at these estimates and see a correspondence between the model predictions. What I've done on the right here is each blue circle is a data point. This is one of the adults in the sample. There are 300 something of them, right? I forget exactly. And um, uh, weight on the horizontal, <coughs> height on the vertical, and the black line is the map line, the maximum a posteriori line. So I'm going to show you in a minute there are an infinite number of lines in the posterior, and we're interested in all of them to different extents. But we are interested in all of them. Each is a special snowflake, and we want to pay some attention to it. But this is the most special of the snowflakes, because it's at the top. Uh, but there are a lot of lines near it that are nearly equally plausible, and we're going we're gonna to look at those next. But right now, you can see a correspondence between these mean values. They define the location of this map line. Uh, this line has, um, has the uh, intercept, the y-intercept, of about 114. And you can't see it on this graph, because that's the value of height when weight is zero. And weight is zero off the left-hand side of this graph. This is a general problem with intercept parameters. They, they typically have no biological meaning of any kind, uh, unless you scale your data in some special way. That's just an awkwardness that is normal, and I'm not going to hide it from you. Um, beta, then, is this slope with 0.9, and that's, well, the slope. It's the rise over run of this line, right? So that's exactly what it is. But it's only the map line. And then the standard deviations uh, of these parameters give you the uncertainty around that. And we also want to plot that on this line. So that's what we're going to spend most of the time today doing, is looking at ways to get the uncertainty onto the graph so you can visualize your confidence or lack of confidence in exactly what's going on. In this case, we're going to have a lot of confidence where the line is because there's a lot of data. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to subtract data out, or rather I'll trickle it in a few observations at a time so you can see how the Bayesian model becomes more and more confident as you add more individuals to the sample. Uh, and we'll see uh, uh, sort of the envelope of prediction change. So how do we get uncertainty onto the line? Well, unsurprisingly, we're going to sample from the posterior. Uh, this is a procedure with these models you can do all this analytically. Um, and I've taught it that way before, but uh, like I said, I usually lose half the class immediately uh, with that, not because that half of the class is dumb or anything like that, it's because they're human. And uh, so I'm doing it this way, both because, as I said before, I can carry everybody along this way. And once you get to Markov Chain Monte Carlo, this is the only way you're going to be able to do it. Everybody has to do it this way, because you only get samples in that case. You have no analytical uh, option. So. Uh, here's the recipe, and I'm going to walk you through this in code form and show you what the graphs look like. Um, we want to get uncertainty onto that graph. We sample from the posterior, which means we use uh, the map estimates, which are the means of each, uh, in the posterior means for each parameter, and the standard deviations uh, to approximate the posterior. Um, well, there's also, I, I forgot to put this on there, also the, the correlations between the parameters, which I'll show you um, starting on the next slide. Uh, 
because these parameters alpha, beta, and sigma also have correlated uncertainty there because because the posterior distribution holds common relative has has probabilities for combinations of parameters, right? And we only get a posterior slice for any particular parameter when we ignore the others and average over the uncertainty in them. Uh, uh, then we can sample from uh, we're making we're, we construct a quadratic approximation of this multivariate posterior distribution. Since it's Gaussian in every dimension, it's a multivariate Gaussian distribution, and this is an easy mathematical object, trust me. Uh, and R is really good at taking samples from these. Um, in the book, I give you details about how to do this in the, in the MacGyver way. You don't need to use my convenience functions. You can do this on the raw. Um, and then you use these samples to generate predictions to integrate over the uncertainty. The last step is the more complicated one. The first two are largely automated for you. And the last one, you've got some freedom of choice, actually. And so that's the part where anxiety grows. And that's perfectly normal. So I'm going to show you a bunch of examples as the course goes on. Uh, first thing, um, it, the Precy uh, function uh, can show you the correlations among the parameters if you use this optional core equals true. And what it's showing you here is the correlation. It's called the correlation matrix among the parameters. This is something that's computed when the fitting is done. Uh, and this, these are all the values that you need shown on the screen here to define the multivariate um, normal distribution that is that we're assuming the posterior is. So I want you to see this is a matrix. So uh, each parameter is perfectly correlated with itself. That's comforting, right? And uh, then uh, nothing is correlated with sigma. Sigma's got a zero with everybody except itself, right? It's independent of the others. This is very typical with simple linear regressions that the standard deviation is uncorrelated with where the line is. Uh, it's like the line is chosen. Uh, those of you who had previous training in OLS regression, you may remember this. It's like you choose the line and then you pick sigma. And you could do it that way, even though this way we're doing it all simultaneously. Um, and then the intercept and the slope are really strongly associated. They have a negative correlation that's almost one. Uh, so they contain almost the same information. Now, you're thinking to yourself, why is that true? It's nearly always true that slopes and the, and the intercepts are correlated because if you change the slope, you change the intercept of the line, right? And that makes them correlated. Uh, nevertheless, in, in the book, I show you that if you uh, standardize the data, uh, you can remove this correlation entirely. And that's worth taking a look at. We'll do some examples of that later. Yeah, question? Uh, the question was, is sigma something like the residuals? Um, in non-Bayesian statistics, uh, sigma is often called the residual, the residual error variance or something like that, the residual standard deviation. So I think if you use um, our LM command at the bottom, it gives you a number which will be very close to what you get from sigma, but it's not the same thing uh, for various technical reasons. I mean, you should expect them never to be exactly the same because in frequent statistics, you never have probabilities of parameters, so it can't be the same thing. Uh, and OLS regression doesn't actually estimate sigma. It has no model of the data based upon that, really. It kind of fits it after the fact. Um, so, which is all fine. I mean, that's not to say it doesn't work. It's just a different logical procedure to get it. It's also true that there's this dividing by n minus 1 thing that has polluted uh, statistics and is nearly always useless because it's meant to give you an unbiased estimate of these parameters, which is something in Chapter 6 I want to prove to you is uh, you don't want unbiased estimates. Because bias improves accuracy. Uh, and that's just, and I know you're like, this is madness. Who is this guy? Uh, uh, and this is because this is the pollution of statistical jargon. Bias in statistics is not a bad thing. It's just somebody, I think it was Fisher, called this thing that was perfectly okay uh, bias, and it made it sound bad. And then people got attached to the idea of finding unbiased estimators. But unbiased estimators are hardly ever the best estimates of anything. So, uh, so I got off on this slide. That said, with even reasonable amounts of data, you know, n minus 1 and n are basically the same. So uh, if n is even reasonably large. And so it has, in practice, it has very little effect. Um, but that's just something to watch out for. We'll return to this when we get there. So the, but they'll be practically the same, uh, as you'll see. The difference here, of course, is we get a distribution for sigma, right? We get its uncertainty. Uh, and as the amount of data increases, it gets more and more precise. Um, and, then, and when you simulate observations from a linear regression, you care about that uncertainty because sigma affects the spread around the mean. Uh, that you anticipate in observations that you're going to see. And we're going to work with that particular issue uh, today. Um, okay. Uh, so we can easily sample from the multivariate normal. We got all the numbers we need to do it. Um, let me show you how to visualize uh, the uh, 
samples from the posterior before I show you how to extract them in this case. Um, so I'm showing you uh, alpha against beta uh, on the top left here. And you can see the minus 0.99 correlation in the sample. So each point in that graph is a sample from the posterior distribution of those two parameters. So that's, that's uh, marginalizing over sigma, which you can't see in that. It's like sigma is the dimension that you can't see that's coming straight out at you or such. Um, uh, and uh, as if, so what this tells you is, is if A is a larger number, B must be a smaller number in order to get an equally plausible line. And there are a large number of, of approximately equally plausible lines along a thin ridge of combinations of alpha and beta uh, that are negatively correlated with one another. Uh, and this is the thing you'll start to get natural in your head is that the posterior distribution contains combinations of parameters. So in this case, it contains lines and the spread around them. Yeah, question. Is this in part because is it still the case with Bayesian regression that you have to pass through the mean of Height and weight, so you got to, You are rotating around an axis. Uh, so the question was: Is it still true in Bayesian regression that you have to pass through the mean of both? It's not true in general because we have priors, right? Uh, but with flat priors, yes, you will. The map will pass through the mean of, of both the x and the y variables. It actually it'll pivot through exactly, and that's why you get this correlation. So if you if you center these variables so that the mean of x and y are zero then you get the intercept for free. And I know you know this. Uh, and so in that case, they'll be uncorrelated. And I have an example in the book uh, like that as well. Uh, so, but this is exactly an artifact of the measurement scale. Is one way you could think about it. But if you had really strong priors, you could push the estimates away from that mean, mean point, right? You could always do that. You could choose stupid priors and, and get absolutely a stupid answer whenever you want, right? Uh, absolutely true. OK. Um, so, and then I wanted to show you the lack of correlation between sigma and beta is shown in the upper right. If you drew one for alpha, it looked the same. It's just a snowball. That's what no correlation looks like, right? There's no association between sigma and beta there, but they're both Gaussian. So you get this Gaussian <laughs> hill, uh, uh, like a snowball that's been thrown down on the ground. Actually, I have no idea what a snowball would look like if you threw it down on the ground. Probably wouldn't look like that, but that, let's call that a snowball. Looks like a snowball. Um, does this make sense? Yeah, question. Why they're not perfectly correlated, or well, it's still true that the values in the middle are more plausible. There are more values in the center of that posterior distribution. That are, that's where the map is. The map is right in the middle there, at the mean of uh, alpha and beta. There's a map estimate, and that's the most plausible line. Uh, and then there are less plausible lines as you move away from it, and those are highly correlated, uh, but they're not perfectly the same. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah, exactly. They're not completely redundant. You do need them both. Um, okay. So uh, in, in the in the book, I show you how to use um, how to do this. Uh, there's a convenience function function in the rethinking package called extract samples. It does exactly what it sounds like. If you have a fit model that a model you fit with map, um, it pulls out uh, the map values. It pulls out the the correlation matrix, and it pulls out the standard deviation of each parameter, and it uses that to construct the multivariate normal distribution. In the notes, I show you how to do this in the raw yourself. There's a little box on how to do it if you're curious. Um, it, it's easy to do. And uh, what you get back is a data frame, like the raw data frame you'd work with, where every column is a parameter. Be this, they're not data, right? They're parameters. And every row is a sample, a set of samples from the posterior distribution. And these columns have the right correlation structure in them, uh, defined by the map estimate, which is defined by the curvature uh, of this multidimensional hill, right, in Hilbert space. You want to think about it that way? Um, and uh, I'm only showing you the first five here, but I think by default we get 10,000, uh, which is usually way more than you need. Uh, but it's an adjustable parameter. Uh, if you look at the helper extract samples, you'll see it. Does this make sense so far? These are just like the samples that drove you nuts on your homework. Right, but you did those yourself in the raw using sample. Um, this is automating it a bit because it's using the quadratic approximation. Uh, but we're still samples. Once we've got them, we can treat them the same way. Uh, we can push them back through the model to generate predictions. We can sum over ranges of them to answer questions about where where the relative plausibility of values are. Things like that. They're samples again. They're a way of avoiding doing integral calculus. Right. Um, so. I want to encourage you to think about this. What we've actually sampled are lines. 
And every row in the samples of the posterior is a different, defines a different regression line. And the, the density of lines of different placements and angles corresponds to the relative plausibilities in the posterior distribution of particular regression lines. And there's an, so you think of it this way. What, what Bayesian models do is uh, you define the question it's asking through this modeling language, and then it considers every possible combination of the parameters and assigns them a relative plausibility conditional on the data. So in this case, that means it, cons it considers every possible regression line right, in the x and y uh, plane, and it ranks them by their posterior probability, which is, again, remember, it's the relative numbers of ways that that line could generate the observation. Right? So it's still conditional on your model, but it's the garden of forking data still. It's still just that. We're still just counting the relative numbers of ways that different conjectures could produce the observations that we have. Um, and so in this case, those conjectures are lines with some scatter around them, and there are an infinite number of them, and our machine has ranked them all. You're welcome. <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, victory for mathematics. And, but now you have to, like, this is like an interview with the model, right? It's like interview with a vampire, but uh, interview with the model. And if anybody, somebody remembered that movie, book, actually, but <laughs> remembered that movie. Was Tom Cruise in that movie? Yeah. Something? Okay. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, <yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of sexy men in that movie. Yes. Uh, so. Those, anyway, I'm tempted. This is being recorded and going on the internet, so I'm going to resist some natural jokes. Some of you who know me you know my sense of humor, and you know. <laughs> Especially when Antonio Banderas comes up. But it's easy to distract me. But, uh, okay, we're going to just like, part of that brain has got to turn off now, and we're going to move on here. So, all right, so we've got a bunch of lines. And uh, I'm just showing you, uh, again, this is just showing you that we've got these numbers. Uh, the a and b values defined a line, and we're going to I'm going to neglect sigma for the moment. But remember, that's defining this scatter of observations you expect around how scattered the observations are supposed to be around this line, because um, a and b just define the mean, the expected height at each weight. Uh, but people will obviously be sampled around it in nature. So, and then I'm showing you um, for just the first ten adults in the data. Say we fit this model for only ten individuals. Uh, I do this so you can see the scatter in the lines. But, uh, you'll see when we use all 300 something, and they're all on top of one another. Um, just for the first 10, and I plot, I think this was the first 100 uh, uh, lines from this table. So I just take the first 100 rows here, and I plot the, I, I use the A and B values to define lines, and I plot them with some transparency. You can see how they overlap. And then, so you can see the scatter, right? That with only 10 data points, the machine is telling you, you know, they're definitely positively associated, but I don't know exactly how much. And I'm not sure where the intercept is either. It's, there's only 10 individuals after all. What do you want from me? Right. It's just kind of, so you get this scatter like that and you can see it. In fact, this is my favorite way of representing uncertainty for Bayesian models. It's just plotting multiple curves. Uh, readers can see really obviously what's going on. That said, I'm going to show you conventional ways to do it uh, that give you fancy shading and stuff like that. But uh, this is a nice way to do it, and it works for all types of models, even really ones that are quite complicated. Um, we're going to do some... Uh, some distance matrix models at the end of the course, and uh, this will this will work great for that because you're you're sampling distributions uh, from the posterior uh, distribution in that case. So yeah, you've got distributions in your distribution, right? So this is like like pimp your ride. Uh, those of you who know that, is like an exhibit? Was that? Yeah. So I'm glad people still remember this. I'm not old yet. Um, <laughs> does this make sense so far? Yeah. Right now we just got lines in your distribution. There's a distribution of lines, and they're their relative presences in the posterior distribution correspond to the relative numbers of ways they could produce the data conditional on the model. Uh, now let's add data back in. We've only, we start with only the first 10 adults. Let's uh, look at the first 50. If I said feed 50 to the model, um, now I do the same procedure. I plot the first 100 regression lines. The first 50 individuals are shown up there. Uh, the cloud of points is narrower now. There's still uncertainty about it, but they're scattered about it. They differ in their slopes and their intercepts, of course, uh, but it's getting tighter, and you can see how the cloud of points, it's getting darker because they're overlapping more. Yeah? The model is learning. And uh, with uh, 150 individuals, which is just about half the data, um, you can see now it's, it's quite tight, but there's a difference in uncertainty in different regions of the data. And this is something you're used to with linear regressions. This is bow tie uncertainty that arises in them. Uh, we're pretty sure uh, 
at the average weight what the average height will be. But we're a lot less sure at extreme weights, low or high, what the average height should be. A lot less uncertainty out there. Uh, this is a famous thing again, and uh, David hinted at this when he talked about pivoting on, on the mean of both variables. In this case, it is. Uh, we're we're going to pivot through the mean weight and mean height, and the regression line is going to pass through somewhere near there, almost guaranteed. Otherwise, it won't be a good fit. Uh, but the that means that slight changes in the slope, though, a slight uncertainty in the slope can create big uncertainty at extreme values because the whole line is pivoting, right? Because you assumed it was a line. It's probably not a line in reality, right? Because nothing's actually a line. Uh, but uh, forever. Um, and then with all the data, all 352 adults in the sample, um, you can see that they overlap quite a lot. They're still the only place you can see some scatter in these 100 lines drawn from the posteriors out at the extremes. Does this make some sense? Uh, and this is linear regression as you've always known it, uh, just it's described in a different language. And it's, it's a language in which the, the estimate and the uncertainty are the same thing. They're a distribution of the relative plausibilities of different values of the parameters. Uh, I'll let you process the uncertainty this way. Um, so uh, we can think about uh, doing this in general uh, for any values of weight. So once you have samples from the posterior distribution, you can generate, you can make the model predict things. Uh, and not just for the data you've already seen, right? That would be like retrodiction, and that's what we do in posterior predictive checks, and that's what you did in your homework that you're going to turn in today. Uh, I know a lot of you already have because there are lots of little stars in SmartSight where you turned in things. Um, but, you know, midnight is your deadline. That's all I'm saying. Midnight's fine. Actually, 1, 1 a.m. is fine, too. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on Alaska time. Whatever. <laughs> but, uh, but isn't Alaska in power? Yes. Yeah. Something? Yeah, so... Um, uh, but we might want to do other things, and, and we, we will. Uh, you might want to do some forecasting, or you might want to do experiments in prediction to understand how the model works. Uh, and so I'm going to show you this, this way of generating these predictions uh, uh, in general for the average uh, from the posterior samples. And this will simultaneously teach you how to get visualize the uncertainty over the data you did see and do what I'm going to call... Uh, especially next week, counterfactual prediction, where you consider the behavior of the model for data you haven't seen, which is a very useful way to understand how it works. Uh, so, summarize, we, we still have our samples from the posterior in this symbol post. I'm going to try to behave and always use post for samples for the posterior. Um, if I misbehave, scream at me, please, and I'll fix it. Uh, consistency is, is a difficult thing, but I, I'm, try, I'm working towards it. Um, and the way you generate predictions for these models is, well, you know the model, and the model is mathematical, so you can just plug samples back into the formula for the model and make it say things to you. So if you want to know the mean at a particular weight, um, the, ex the expected height at a particular weight, well, you know the equation, and it's shown at the bottom of this slide, for the expected height at a particular weight. It is mu i. Uh, it is alpha plus beta xi. So if you plug in a value for xi, and then you put in samples for alpha and beta, which you have, you can generate predictions for any combinations of them. Now, we want to average over the uncertainty in the posterior distribution. And, and normally to do this, if, so if you were just going to do a prediction at the map, you could just plug in 114 here and 0.9 here, which I think were the map values in this example, and that would be fine. But to do the uncertainty, you definitely can't just plug in values independently uh, because alpha and beta are correlated, remember. So you have to draw correlated pairs and luckily, we've already done that. They're, they're shown on the top of this slide, right? The, the alpha and beta columns are almost perfectly negatively correlated as a consequence. And so if we just plug in the alpha and beta values on rows here into an expression like this, we get a bunch of predictions that have the right kind of uncertainty. Uh, we get a distribution of expected heights at a weight of, say, 50 in this example. And then you can summarize that distribution. And this is bound to be confusing because it's weird. Uh, it's not how humans interact with the world. So I'm going to show you what this looks like in pictures. Uh, if we did that in this case, um, we store in the symbol mu at 50, which is at the weight of 50. What is the, what is the mu uh, that comes from it? What the posterior distribution tells us is, because parameters have distributions, because they're uncertain, everything you compute with parameters is also uncertain. It must also have a distribution. I'll say that again, because this is like, if there's any law in Bayesian inference, it is that since there's uncertainty about parameters, Parameters have a distribution, and therefore everything you compute with parameters should have a distribution. Yeah? You can say this to yourself over and over again. I'll have many opportunities to do it. And uh, so the expected height at weight 50 it should be a distribution, 
And you get that automatically from this one line of code because the posterior distribution is a distribution. Uh, and R is great when you give it uh, from this line of code, post dollar sign A means take the A column from the object post. Then we add to that the B column from object post times 50. And since post dollar sign A and post dollar sign B are vectors, they're lists of 10,000 numbers, it just iterates over them, each one. Uh, and there's 10,000 values in each, so it returns 10,000 answers. It takes the first value for A, it adds that to 50 times the first value for B. Sits that aside. It's the first answer in mu at 50. It does it for the second, third. It's, it's done by the time your screen refreshes, right? Because your laptop is really fast uh, these days. Um, there'll be models later on where you have to wait like a second, and you'll notice that it's a little bit slow, but it'll be fine. Um, and then I show this distribution on the bottom. It's a density uh, distribution like any other. Um, uh, it's pretty tight, though, because there's not a lot of uncertainty about, because there's 352 data points, um, there's not a lot of uncertainty about where the mean is, and that's all we're talking about right now is the expected height. This doesn't take into account sigma yet. And the expected individual is, has a height a little over 159 uh, with a very tight range uh, around that. See that? There's a distribution. In your homework, which is already up on the website, you're going to do things like this for different kinds of weights and generate predictions for unobserved individuals. Uh, so you can do some mental exercise in this kind of forecasting. So imagine you had all these estimates and then you know, your, your field assistant said, oh, you know what, we didn't record the height for this one person, but I got them, I weighed them. Uh, uh, so after you know, firing this person, then you have to like, impute the height, right? <laughs> so your model lets you generate a prediction, but that prediction will have uncertainty, and you can get the expected value and the uncertainty from the same calculation because you have a distribution for the height, expected height. Make some sense? It will make sense when you solve question one on your homework because that's what you're going to do. Um, oh, question, question. Yes? So you see you get the expectation and the, and the variance about it. So if you're, if you're doing this imputation for the person, should this include the, the added uncertainty about sigma about this point, or is this sufficient? Okay, so the question was, uh, when you do this, uh, should you also include the added uncertainty that comes from sigma, that is the scatter around this, and this is just a mean? And I think the answer is it depends. It depends on what you want to know. Uh, in your homework, I'm just going to ask for this distribution, basically. Um, and I want you to characterize it with an interval, and the mean and the interval. Uh, but it may be that you care about the standard deviation as well. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but it depends upon your purpose, I think. Right? Uh, so if you have some sort of epidemiological application in mind with this, and there's some stature at which individuals come into risk, uh, you absolutely need to use sigma, right? Because you need realizations. You need to know what's observable, right? Uh, but that's not what I'm going to ask you in your homework to do. But I could imagine doing that in a case where, okay, you want to know, uh, uh, given these estimates, what proportion of individuals at a certain weight are going to have a stature below this level. Then you're going to need sigma because you're going to need to do, you're going to need to get samples for actual realized heights. These are samples for average heights at a particular weight. So these are about an aggregation in a sense, if that makes sense. So there's no, again, it's like horoscopes. Yeah, this is horoscopic advice right now. Um, okay, so uh, let me show you how to use uh, a nice convenience function in the rethinking package, which automates the thing you just saw in the previous slide. Uh, and this will work for anything you can fit with math. Well, I shouldn't say anything. That's like famous last words. I'm sure you could come up. You guys are clever, and you can always come up with some way to break my software, which I cherish, actually. It's a wonderful a wonderful thing. Uh, last time I taught this, there was a, a student, Helen, Helen Shimura, some of you know her, came up with a really interesting bug. And I now I have named it in the code Helen's Corner Case uh, in honor. <laughs> and so if any of you can come up and find really delicious bugs, let me know and then you will be, you will live on in, in, in fame in my, in my note, in my code. Uh, so uh, I'll buy you coffee too. Uh, <laughs> we're hunting bugs here. It's all I can afford. I don't make a lot of money. I'm an anthropologist. I can buy you coffee. That's, that's how it goes. So, uh, but really, if things malfunction and you can figure out a way to make stuff go wrong, let me know. I want to know because I'm trying to make this as close to bulletproof as possible. You folks are very clever at shooting bullets into stuff. So I value that. Um, so I've got this. There's this function I want to show you that automates that step before. It can do that because when you fit the map model, you told it the model. So R already knows the model. There's no point in retyping it. Uh, it's good the first few times to do it so that you know what you're doing. Absolutely. Uh, and when I teach you this the first time, I'm always going to show you sort of the raw way that things work. Uh, but in your daily life, you want some automation uh, because you're in a hurry. You're going to get the Nobel Prize, right? You've got to beat someone else to it. So uh, use your convenience code. Um, but here's the general way to think about it. It's the same procedure. Say we want to generate 
uh, do that same exercise, but for a range of weights, some sequence of weight values, because we're trying to say, what does the regression line look over some particular range of weights? Or we just have a list of individual weights, and we want to generate a posterior distribution of expected heights for each of those individuals. Uh, what you do is you make a vector or a sequence of weight values that you want predictions for. Um, and that's what the code here is doing right now. Nothing exciting about this. We make a symbol weight.sequence. We use the sequence function, SEQ, which just makes a sequence of numbers. Uh, it has a bunch of options. In this case, you just define its minimum bound, which is 25, its upper bound is 70, and it increments by 1. So this is just a list of numbers from 25 to 70 in increments of 1. Does that make sense? Um, those of you who, uh, uh, who have been using R for a while know that you can just do 25 colon 70 and get the same answer, right? Because it's a shortcut. That actually calls this function is what it does. It's a shorthand for it. It's the binary operator for calling sequence. Um, once you've got that, you've got a list of values that you want posterior distributions for. Um, and then we're going to call this function called link. Uh, uh, link refers to something called a link function, which will be special to us later on in the course. There's, a, there's one here, but it's hidden now. It's called the identity link, which just means you can't see it, sort of. Uh, and, uh, but what this does is, th think of it this way, it creates a link between the parameters and the uh, parameters in the likelihood function. Right? The parameters like alpha and beta, it links them to the things at the top level that produce observables, like the, the, the data that we're anticipating. Um, it connects them. And so you give it your fit model, and you give it some data to con compute predictions for. Uh, and uh, what it returns is, so in this case, um, there are 46 values in weight.sequence. Uh, and I guess I was wrong before. There are only 1,000 samples um, uh, that it's going to use in this case. So the answer that's returned in the symbol mu is a matrix with dimension 1,000 by 46. What does this mean? For each of the 46 weight values, we get 1,000 samples. So there, these are posterior distributions for each weight value uh, described by 1,000 samples, which is plenty in this case because it's Gaussian. 1,000 is more than enough to see the shape. Yeah? Uh, so uh, you could pull out each column, right? The second dimension is columns, and that's each of the weights that are in that sequence. And, and if you plotted those 1,000, there'd be a distribution, which is the distribution of expected weights of average, or heights, excuse me, of expected heights at each of those weights. Um, our goal is going to be to put this on a graph as a line, as a cluster of lines with some shading. And that's what we're going to do in a minute. Um, but this is all that's going on here. You guys with me so far? Or at least you're willing to indulge me to get through the rest of the story and then you'll figure it out at home or something like that? Yeah, which is fine. Um, okay. Let me uh, spend a little bit of time talking about how Link actually works. And you don't have to master this, but I want to demystify what's going on so that you know. I mean, I absolutely use Link. But at some point in your life, it will break. <laughs> uh, and then you'll want to do this yourself. And I want to reassure you that it's not hard. Link is a tiny, simple function. Don't look at the code, but it's a tiny, simple function. <laughs> actually, the code is kind of long because it's trying to you know, stop corner cases and stuff like that. But, um, and it has to anticipate any crazy thing you might have entered into Mac. Right, and an infinite number of models can be defined in maps, so you can imagine I have to deal with a lot of stuff. But um, the basic uh, template is pretty easy when you know the model. So I'm going to show you here. Here's the top part's the recipe. So the first thing uh, a function like link needs to do is it samples from the posterior distribution. So it gets a bunch of samples for each parameter, and those, those samples are correlated across the parameters in the right way. Then we define some series of predict, uh, predictor values. In this case, that predictor variable is weight, so it's a series of values for weight. But whatever model you're working with, it might not be weight. It could be something else. It could be speed. Um, then for each predictor value, for each sample from the posterior, we compute mu. And you can do this because you know the equation for mu. So you've got some pair of correlated A and B values, right? They come from, they're on a row in your posterior, and you know the weight value. You just plug them in. Get that answer, set it aside. You'll get a thousand of those if you have a thousand samples. Then move on to the next weight value, do a thousand more calculations, and so on. This is why we make the computer good. But this is all it's doing. It's just looping, right? And R is really good at looping. And then at the end, you summarize, and that's up to you. This is when you have to make a choice. Uh, the typical choice is here because it's these distributions are going to be Gaussian. Is you use the mean and the standard deviation, or the mean and some confidence interval, and you can describe everything about it uh, from that. Um, this code at the bottom, I'm going to step through it, but the code, this code at the bottom is sufficient to do all the calculations on the, that link does. Uh, this is really the minimal link 
that goes on. Just a few lines. So I want to uh, take the next two minutes, say, and step through this code for you. And this will be maybe the last time I step through our code in any detailed way. The famous last words. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, and again, you're not meant to master this skill. But I want to demystify it. And there will be a time in your life when you need to do this for some crazy custom model. Uh, you will be able to do it because you'll just replace the part of this where you calculate mu with whatever you need to calculate in your model. Right? There'll be some little organ in your model, a kidney, so to speak. Mu is like this model's kidney. And uh, uh, it's the kidney of different models is different. Um, but you know what it is because you define the model, and you can always calculate things for it, given samples from the posterior distribution. So let me step through it real quick. All right, step one, we sample from the posterior. So uh, uh, we store in the symbol post. Um, all these uh, samples from the posterior extract samples just pulls out the correlation matrix and uh, the marginal uh, posterior of each parameter samples from that multivariate posterior stores them in a data frame. I'm showing you here this function str. str in, in function in R is how you figure out how code works. It stands for structure. It tells you the structure of any object that you have in your system right now. And you guys know R is like a, a, a massive calculator, right? It's a true and complete calculator. <laughs> compute anything that's computable. Uh, but it really is like a big calculator with a lot of memory. So uh, everything in its memory is called an object. And when you want to, you don't know what an object is, you can use str to see what its guts look like in a scaffold way. It's a, it's a great way to figure out what other people's code is doing, and sometimes your own. <laughs> it's like, so I encourage you when you're trying to figure out examples <coughs> in the book, uh, or why your homework is not working, is to use str to inspect the intermediate results in your code. So I'm going to go through this slide that way. At every step, we're going to look use str to see what's going on in there. Um, so in this case, it's just a data frame with 10,000 observations. Those observations are samples, right? They're not actually observations. They're just imaginary observations. Uh, for three variables, which are not actually variables, they're, they're parameters, right? Uh, and you've seen this before, nothing unexpected. Um, now, I'm going to define a function. This is maybe the tricky part. Um, a function is just some reusable code. Uh, you, can, you can actually make code into an object in R and then use it as a variable to do things. In fact, you can pass new values into it substitutably. And these, these reusable chunks of code are called functions in programming languages. And you can define as one as easily as making a symbol for it, use the assignment operator, and then use the header function. Parentheses wait means there's one argument, one variable input that could take on different values, and it's going to have the name wait. Uh, that name will apply inside the code that's to come. And then you just write the linear model. right? And notice the linear model uses post, so it assumes you've already done the first step. So it can find the samples. So what does this thing return? Well, let me show you. Let's look at the structure of calling mu.link with value 50. 50 is a weight value. Uh, the answer is, 10, is a vector of 10,000 values. Why? Because there were 10,000 samples in post. For each of those, it computed mu at the weight 50. Yeah, you with me? Um, and then step three. We define the weight values to compute predictions for, the ones we actually want. And we're going to pass these into mu.link in a minute, uh, less than a minute. Uh, and I use sequence again. And again, if you don't want to know what's inside weight.sequence, you can just do structure on it, SDR. And you see it's 46 values from 25 uh, to 70. You can't see the end, the dot, dot, dot. Right. It's like passive aggressive text messaging, dot, dot, dot. Right. <laughs> um, uh, now the action. Uh, this is the most confusing part. Uh, is this wonderful? There's a wonderful set of functions in R that have the word apply in them, uh, and they are magic. And they do so much great stuff. They're also very confusing. Uh, but I'm going to use one here. What they what apply functions do is they take a, a sequence of values, sometimes a matrix of values, and they pass them into a function, and they collect all of the different answers, and they put them in a nice package for you. Um, so they apply some complicated structure and and perform an operation on it. They apply the operation to the input. Um, and and that, those inputs and operations can be pretty complicated. In this case, they're not that bad, but you can see the value of it in any event. What s apply, which means simplified apply, uh, does is it takes each of the values in weight.sequence and it passes it into mu link. Now, the answer for mu link is a vector of link 10,000. So each answer is 10,000 numbers. So s apply packages them up into a matrix uh, of dimension 10,000 by 46. Right. Again, where each row is a sample and each column is a, a, a predictor value that you have passed in to input. Make sense? Um, this is what link is doing for you and why you happily don't have to do this for yourself. And uh, 
So let me let me quickly go through S supply in a schematic sense because as you're you don't necessarily have to worry about it this term because you're gonna I'm gonna keep you busy. Uh, but uh, in your future in R, you'll solve problems with the apply function. So I want to give you some sense in general how they work. Uh, S apply is a great one because it simplifies the answer into a nice uh, matrix you can work with, and rather than a list. Um, so let's just start. You know, you can make a list of ten numbers in R with one colon ten. That means a sequence of integers from one to ten. So I just want to show you that to start with. Uh, we can then take S apply and and use that as an input this series of integers from 1 to 10 and pass it into any function uh, like this and it will pass them each and individually each of those numbers from 1 to 10 collect the answer and then make a vector that holds all the answers. Uh, S applies good for this. This is a bit overkill here but I'm just trying to show you the answer. So what this does is computes the square of each of the numbers. So there's this little symbol Z there's nothing special about calling it Z again call it pickle if you want whatever you want. Uh, the computer will not care and uh, just make sure that you use the same name in the code part of your function as you do in the argument, where you define the argument. So all that does uh, is compute squares, but you can do much fancier things. Um, so uh, uh, this uh, computes the geometric mean uh, of each of those values, uh, right? The zth root of the product of z values is the geometric mean of those values, and that's what this does. Not that you want to do this, but I'm showing you it's up to you what it does. But these apply functions are just ways to do some operation on a list or a matrix, uh, and they save a lot of effort. And so that's why I use it there, and you'll see it in other people's code. So it's just worth it's worth dwelling on it for just a second here. Um, okay, uh, let's pick up where we left off. We were on step four. We use s apply. We've got this big matrix now. Uh, now we need to do some summary. And uh, the way I want to encourage you, at least for the moment in this course, the next several weeks, is to use the apply function to do summaries of these. Um, and the way apply works, uh, applies the more general version of s-apply. You pass mu is a matrix, uh, so that's the thing you're going to apply. The two means the second dimension of the input, which means columns. Right? And the columns are these 46 values. So what, uh, and then for each column, you're going to compute the mean. So what this means is, take this matrix, and for each column, give me the mean. I'll say that again. So what this line of code at the bottom means is, for each, uh, uh, for the matrix mu, for each column of it, compute the mean. And it stores those means in mu.mean, and then if you look at the result, you see there's 46 values, and each of those is the mean of the posterior distribution of expected heights for each of those weight values that you plugged in before. Okay, I appreciate there's a lot of moving parts here, and you can sit down with a cup of tea later and go through this again, and you'll really get it. Um, but it's important for me to demystify what's going on here, because... Uh, uh, demystification leads you to distrust your models, uh, which I think is a healthy thing because they're crazy little machines, uh, and you're always smarter than they are. Yeah, question. Can you try to explain the link function again? So, the, the link function, the yeah. basic link function. So the question was, could I could I explain the link function again? Uh, so let me uh, maybe go. Well, I don't want to go back all the way. Uh, so what link does is it lets you pass in a set of predictor values for the, any predictor variable you use in your model. And it'll compute uh, the posterior distribution of the linear model uh, at those predictor values. Uh, so in this case, the linear model, you called it mu. So in mu is defined as the mean of the Gaussian distribution of outcomes. So what link does is it computes the distribution of mu at any set of predictor values you like. Uh, so that's how you pass it in. So it's the idea, like on your homework, I'm going to ask you to say, um, say I've got a person who uh, uh, has some particular weight, you know, 30 stones, whatever that is. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? Some of your measure weight stones, that would be a big, very large person. And so, so someone weighs 30 stones, uh, tell me what this model says, how, how tall they should be if they were a Kalahari forager. And um, the model will give you some absurd answer, but you, could, you compute that by plugging that weight into the linear model, but you have to integrate over the uncertainty in the parameter values, and Link does that for you because it computes a mu for every sample from the posterior, and it gives you that collection back. It gives you all of them. So if they're, by default, it does a thousand of them, but there's an adjustable parameter in, you can do as many as you like, within reason. Did that, did, was that a sufficient answer for now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They'll get in there and they fight with it. Need that cup of tea right yeah, exactly. Uh, if you're like me, you'll need many cups of tea over the years to really start to, to get to this stuff. Um, I'm sympathetic to that. Okay. Uh, all right, so let me let me help you visualize this a little bit. So now uh, 
what we're going to look at is the result. So we used link, or we did it uh, the MacGyver way on the previous slide. And uh, by hand, we now have this matrix mu where every row is, um, there are 10,000 rows. Each of those is a sample from the posterior distribution. And there are 46 columns. In each column, there's a different weight that was input as the predictor value. Um, so now we can, we can plot these, actually. So what I'm showing you here are the first 100 rows from this big matrix just plotted up in the space of the data, so to speak. So the, the first line of code here, the plot line, is an empty plot. Uh, the type equals n it makes it empty. It doesn't plot the data points. I did that just so we had a blank field so I could show you what's inside of mu. What's inside of mu are a bunch of little points. For each sample from the posterior, it says mu is a particular thing. The problem is that we don't know which parameters are the quote-unquote real ones. Uh, we've got a distribution of them. So there's a bunch of points in there. If we plot up all these points, just like when we plotted lines before, you can see the differences. So uh, here are our columns, you could so to speak, uh, 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 so to speak, going left to right, you see these little bundles of points that have been plotted up. Uh, the line down here, this loops over the first 100 rows in mu, and it just uh, uh, points, well, draws points. So for each of the weight values, it plots the ith uh, sample, right? So that's the, the ith row in the matrix is what this notation means. Some of you know this already when you, the comma here, since there's nothing after that, that means all of them. Right, so that's all of the weight values, all of the all of the columns of that matrix. So weird thing about R, you get used to it. You can you can actually have mu bracket comma bracket, and that means the whole matrix. Uh, there's a little box inside uh, chapter four about this because it's it's a terrible syntax. It really is. It's just like maddeningly dumb. It's just a horrible thing to do. There should be a symbol that means all, so that people can read your code. Right, the machine can always read your code, but that's not the issue. Right. Uh, we're not trying to make machines happy. We're trying to make one another happy. At least we should be. So anyway, I can't change the syntax. Um, that's just how it is. Uh, when there's nothing after the comma, that means all of the columns. If there was nothing before the column, that would mean all of the rows. Right? So this is the ith row. Mu bracket i comma bracket means the ith row of mu, all of its columns. And so it's the whole row. Um, and that plots all of those. Uh, there's 100 points. Uh, at each of the weight values that are shown there. And you can see how the spread, and this is recapitulating that bow tie uncertainty that we saw before. You can sort of see it there. This is not a great way to display the data, but I'm just trying to expose the what was what Link did. right? What did Link do? It computed these values, and that's all it did. However, that's a lot, because you can do a lot with this. We're still in the interview with the, with the golem. right? Uh, so um, a nicer uh, way to plot this, especially if you want to do a posterior predictive check, uh, is you compute summaries. So, uh, for example, we can apply the mean function to all the columns of mu, and we can get the mean uh, for each of those clouds of points, right? And that defines the map line, unsurprisingly. That's where the map line is, is, is through there. Um, and we can also get the highest posterior density interval. We can, you can apply fancier functions to all this, too. So this means for each column, give me the 95%, uh, the which is the default, the 95% highest posterior density interval. Um, then we'll, what we do is we plot the raw data. Now I'm not hiding it. That gives us the plot in the upper right, right? All the little blue points up there. Um, wrong E2, you'll see it in the notes. That's just the blue that I like, right? Uh, and wrong E means color in Swahili, right? I'm an anthropologist. What do you, what do you want? <laughs> and uh, 0.5 means it's transparent by a half. <laughs> and, uh, well, I, I knew it wasn't a reserved word, right? Uh, there was no way any, any other package in R was using it, so... Uh, I think it was a nice choice. Um, but you'll see it in the notes, and that's all. It's just the blue. Choose, one, choose purple if you want. Uh, and then um, uh, I draw the math line, which is just x values from the weight sequence, y values from u dot mean, right? Because the mean of the posterior distribution at each particular weight is where the math lies, right? Which is the peak. Um, and then there's this function shade, which I'll leave magical. Uh, it's a function in the rethinking package which draws this shaded boundary, which you can barely see in class, unfortunately, because this is a bit washed out. It'll look better in, in the slides. Um, it takes that uncertainty there, and it makes a shaded interval. The 95% density of the scatter of lines around the map gets shaded in. Uh, it just computes that, that polygon. There's a polygon that gets computed, and it does it uh, for you. It'll be easier to see that shading. Let me show you what it looks like with less data. Um, yeah, question before I, before I do this. just a clarification. So the mu dot mean is 
the mean of the distribution of height means at yes. each particular weight. Well said. Yes. <laughs> the question was mu dot mean is it's a vector of means of mean heights at each weight in the input vector. Exactly right. Yes, how many levels of recursion of abstraction can you hold in your head at once? Exactly, and that's why I'm, I'm very sympathetic to any kind of confusion like you need a cup of tea, yeah, I'm with you. Uh, we'll buy you that cup of tea sometime, anybody. Uh, it's a lot of levels of abstraction, but you start to get used to it. You, you, it gets a lot easier as time goes on. So you can do like three, four levels of abstraction right now. Later on, we'll have more. Multi-level models add another level. Uh, it's all good. It's turtles all the way down, as I always say. So, um, but it's true. We have we have means of distributions of means. Yes, that is exactly what we have. I'm sorry, but it's just how it is. Uh, so let me show you. It, it's easier to see the uncertainty in this case when we use less data, because then you can actually see the shading. So again, all those shaded intervals are doing is summarizing this cloud of lines. They're giving you a visual reference for the cloud of lines. If you like the cloud of lines, by all means, plot the cloud of lines. I think it's easier to understand. Particularly for newcomers to Bayesian inference, it, it immediately says, look, there's a bunch of lines in the posterior. It's full of lines. And some of those lines are more plausible than others. Here are 100 sampled at random. You can see where they tend to lie. Uh, and that kind of speaks for itself. It, it says it. The shading is just a pleasing visual representation of that that's less cluttered than all of these lines. The lines make it hard to see the raw data. Uh, so uh, at least it can in some cases. So the shading has become quite conventional. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with it. So here I'm doing it just with the lines at different amounts of data. And n equals 10 at the top, a lot of scatter. Um, n equals 20, it shrinks uh, quite a lot already until we get to 350 at the end. And there's very little uncertainty about where the, where the map is, where the, this is where the mean is. There's still uncertainty about where the heights are. We're going to do that next. So just hang on. Uh, we'll get to it. Um, and then you can use shading, and you can see the same thing, but now they're nice, pretty, symmetrical bow ties. right? You see these in, in graphs all the time. And ggplot will do this for you automatically for lots of the functions. right? And there's nothing wrong with that. That's cool. But this is where it comes from. Uh, at least this is one way to justify those inputs. Yeah, question? Um, it's probably a pretty dumb question, but does the interpretation for those shaded regions similar to the interpretations for like the sometimes scattered and scattered and scattered? The question was, are, is the interpretation of these shaded regions similar to the interpretation for standard error? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to resist exploring that because it would take too long. Remember, standard errors are constructed by imagining data you haven't seen. And Bayesian estimates are never conditional on data that has not been observed. So these shaded regions are conditional only on the data we have in hand, not on imaginary data that has not been observed. Frequentist estimates are conditional on data that has not been observed. Uh, and I, I, that's a really interesting thing, that distinction. And worthy really of exploration, but this class isn't about that. There was a previous version of this class where I compared the two and talked about the trade-offs of each and all this stuff. But I just don't have, I'm going to beg it off because I, there's no way I can finish the lecture today by doing it. So, but I would resist analogizing any of your knowledge for frequentist statistics to these entities. And just learn this in terms of the garden of forking data. What is the interpretation of this? That's the 95% region of density of the lines in the posterior distribution. That's what it is. And that's all it is. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to say that the, the connections are really compelling. And there are cases where you can translate Bayesian models into non-Bayesian models and vice versa. And that helps you understand both. But I just don't have time uh, to do that in this class and still teach you how to do one thing. Right? So that don't beg it off. I'm not saying that one way is always superior to the other. But they have really different logics. And sometimes it matters. Okay. So prediction intervals. Um, we need to do this before you go. We got lots of time. Uh, we got 15 minutes. So um, what about predicted heights? We want to get sigma onto this graph. Uh, very often, you won't care about sigma. But I want to show you how to do it in case you do. Uh, and it works very much the same way, except now there's an additional layer of sampling because we must simulate observations from some Gaussian distribution. That Gaussian distribution is defined by a combination of alpha, beta, and sigma, right? So it's still the samples from the posterior to tell you what it looks like. But then you must draw a random number from it to simulate an individual. Uh, and so there's one additional thing. Our norm would do this for you, just like you used our binome in your homework uh, to simulate babies, right? Yes? Yes, OK. <laughs> and uh, works the same way. Um, this can be automated with a nice little function of rethinking called sim. Uh, which simulates the 
data, new data from your model instead of link does parameters for the linear model. Whatever you call the linear model in your model, that's what link spits out. It spits out values for that. So if you call it mu, it spits out values for mu. In later models, like logistic regression models, you'll have this little thing in the model called P for the probability of success. It'll be like the probability of a boy in your homework. And in that case, link will give you probabilities. Uh, depends upon the model type. Um, sim in but these cases will give you observable things that you might have seen that would have given you, let you estimate those quantities. So in this case, it'll be heights. In, a, in logistic regression later, it'll be counts of things, counts of events, like baby boys, uh, things like that. Um, sim, you use sim just like you use link, but now the result, you still get a matrix. This was 1,000 by 46 for the same reasons as before, but now the entries are actual heights, so they're broader. Uh, the distributions are more scattered because there's a standard deviation around the mean. Now let's plot them out. Uh, plotting works the same way. Shade works the same way. Um, there's two shaded intervals on here. You can barely see it. There's the dark one in the middle. That's the uncertainty around where the map line is, the uncertainty about where the mean lies, a little, a little tight bow tie uh, deep in the middle. Those of you who are, who are squinting, I apologize. This will look great on your screens at home. Uh, and then there's this really wide shaded interval that almost encloses all the observable data, and that's when you include sigma. Uh, so you get the predictables, the, the simulations of heights. Does this make sense? Uh, I've drawn 95% interval of heights here. There's nothing special about that. I encourage you to try the different ones. In fact, a really pleasing presentation is often to overplot multiple intervals, because then you get this kind of contour of darker shading as it goes out, and you can show people where they, they are. The purpose of this is to communicate the shape of the uncertainty. None of these boundaries is really meaningful. Right? There's nothing special about 95%. It's just convenient to work with. Um, okay. I'm not going to step through SIM in any detail. Uh, I just want to say there's a box on this in the chapter where, again, I explain how it works. It works very much like Link does, except now the function that you S apply across has R norm inside of it. So, again, levels of recursion in your brain. Yes, we, we have simulated values, distributions of values simulated from distributions that are the means of, yeah, I've already lost it. It's something like that, right? But it's all there. That's exactly how it does it. Uh, it's, it samples an individual for each sample from the posterior distribution from the implied normal distribution of heights. And that's all it does. Um, okay. <coughs> Last topic, uh, and uh, we're making comfortable time here, um, is... To ease us, transition us into multiple regression, where we have more than one predictor variable, um, there's this transitional topic uh, often called polynomial regression. And I want to show you how to do this because it's extremely common, but simultaneously I want to discourage you from doing it in your own research. Uh, this is a funny thing, but this will happen more than once in the course. Um, sometimes you have to understand things. But in this case, it's also a really good way to see that these linear models don't necessarily make linear predictions. What's linear about them is the relationship between parameters and data. Uh, that, that it's a linear function, not that the shape of the predictions is linear. So let me. Sh this will help me show you that, um, uh, and also uh, give you some beginning of abstracting about what you can do with these models. So obviously trends are not always linear, and even if trends are linear in a particular range, if you extend that range out long enough, it gets ridiculous, right? So um, uh, on the left here, I'm showing you. Uh, this regression we did for weight versus height, but if you imagine weights increasing, like say we you know put a McDonald's in the Kalahari uh, and we feed people really, this would be a great idea. Actually, I'm all for it. Uh, and uh, seriously, but it would be great. Uh, but uh, you know they get heavier. It, I, I I suspect it will not continue to be a linear trend with height. Eventually, people get wider rather than taller, right? The nutritional impacts, and so and that's nothing wrong with that. It's great to be wide, but. Um, uh, but it can't be linear forever. It just can't. Uh, and then, in contrast, if you if you include kids, uh, uh, which I show you on the right, we plot age against height. Obviously, the relationship between age and height is not linear. It is in certain regions. There are growth spurts where it is. Uh, but for the whole range of your lifespan, at least if you're a mammal, it isn't. Right? We have terminal growth. And uh, so it looks something like that. So you need a different kind of model if you want to predict this. Um, ideally, you'd have some biologically inspired model where you weren't just using a geocentric linear model. That's the first thing to say, and I'll say that over and over again as we go. Um, but in the absence of that, especially in the social sciences, people frequently just use polynomials to do this because polynomials are very flexible. They're functions of one input predictor variable, and you just keep square, you know, squaring and cubing and whatever, you know, quinting. Is that what to the fourth means? 
Uh, and um, or that's fiving, isn't it? Uh, anyway, fouring and fiving and sixing. <laughs> forgot. I took Latin in high school, but you know, then I took a lot of drugs in college and <laughs> forgot it all. Wait, I'm taping this, <laughs> so <laughs> that's okay. I'm an anthro professor. It goes without saying that I did a lot of drugs in college, but so uh, no, but seriously, I can't remember. Uh, anyway, these are very flexible functions. So these are very flexible functions. And uh, so they can fit a lot of shapes. And the more terms you add, the more times they, the path of the curve can turn. And so you can fit all kinds of crazy stuff with them, and people do. Um, it, within restraint, they're useful. The most common is the parabolic model because it allows diminishing returns to something. It allows it to, to slope down. And I'm going to show you that in this case. Um, and I'll also show you uh, a, a cubic, uh, not, just a, uh, not just the quadratic model, the parabola. So... Um, Again, same data, but now we're going to include uh, all of the individuals, not just the adults. We've been working only with adults so far. In the graph in the lower right, the adults are shaded in blue there, and then all the ones we haven't been using are the kid, uh, kids under 18. Uh, they're in black. We're going to include those now. This is not linear, right? Um, we're going to fit a parabola to this. And same data as before, just more of it. There's like 500 individuals now, a little over 500. Um, uh, first thing to do here is to realize... It's very useful when fitting uh, models like this to standardize all the predictor variables before you fit the model. And what standardization means is you take each variable, you subtract its mean from it, and then you divide by the standard deviation of the original variable. And this creates, there's no loss of information here. None of these operations is destructive of information. You're not cheating. It doesn't change the answer you get. It won't change the parameter estimates either. But it makes it easier to fit the model. Your computer will get less hiccups. So this is a really good thing to do by default. Uh, and I encourage you really to do it. Um, so uh, once I give you an equation at the bottom to standardize, uh, you will do this a lot. Uh, it's a really healthy thing to do. In the case of these polynomial equations, sometimes it won't fit at all if you don't do this. Yeah? Just do a similar thing we were talking about, like, uh, centering your predictor plot. Yes. So the question was, is it sort of like centering? Centering is the first part, removing the mean. And that's, that's actually most of the help. The centering gives you most of it. Uh, but it's also good when you divide by the standard deviation, you make everything have this range, this kind of scale, uh, which affects the search range. When Optum is trying to climb hills, uh, it doesn't have this, it gives it a nice uh, graded hill it can find. Uh, if the scale of your data is really, really broad, it won't detect any slope. Uh, and it might be really hard to, do, to search the space. So that's why it's a good thing to do. But centering, in my experience, does most of the work. Uh, we're going to come back to centering in the interaction chapter, where it's, it's pretty useful, especially for interactions. Um, we'll get back to that. It's a good question. Uh, so uh, you want to do this when you practice this at home. Do the standardization. You'll get some idea about it. It changes the units on your x-axis, but it doesn't change the answer. Uh, and you verify yourself by doing it. I think this one will work both ways, but it's a good, healthy habit to get into to standardize. Okay, it's just an artifact of the machine, that how you fit the model is part of the model. Uh, if you want the right answer, standardize. Um, so here's the parabolic model. The only thing that's different here. We've got an extra parameter, uh, b sub 2 now. The second, these aren't really slopes anymore, right? They're the parameters that define the path of this curve. And uh, then the second variable, so to speak, is just the first one squared. This is the formula for a parabola. You will remember from your nightmares in high school, right? Uh, endless homework problems that made no sense with parabolas. And then we define priors, as before. Again, a broad prior for uh, the intercept, because we have no idea where it's going to end up. And then these very mildly conservative priors for the uh, two coefficients, let's call them, uh, the slopes, if you like. But they're not really slopes anymore, right? And uh, then the uniform prior on, on the scale, on sigma. Um, goes into map exactly the same way, right, up there. We put in standardized weight and standardized weight squared. Works great. Uh, by the way, in map, when you write the code in map, you're coding in R. It's just R code, and map executes the code you type. So you could do all kinds of naughty stuff up there if you want. You could put print statements in there, and then every time it executes it, it'll print something. Don't do this, because it'll go really slow. But you could do that, because it really is just trusting the user uh, to do stuff up there. So you can enter arbitrary functions of any kind uh, up in the map code. It just runs it and climbs the hill, what it does. So this fits no problem. Uh, you can plot this over the data exactly as the examples we did previously today. Uh, and in this case, here's your parabola with the uh, shading. I've done the shading there for simulated heights. 
Um, it's very hard to see in the class. So I apologize because it's because of the lighting. Uh, at home, when you look at this, you'll see there's this gray shaded envelope. It misses the heights down here. It kind of goes under the curve in the middle, and then it, in the mass of data in the middle, it does a good job, and it encloses the individuals uh, there. It's the same idea. Now the posterior distribution contains parabolas. And when you sample from the posterior distribution, you're sampling a parabola. So you could plot 100 parabolas on there and visualize the uncertainty in it the same way. Uh, it's the same thing. Posterior distribution can contain anything you can model, right? Later on, we'll put matrices inside of it. We'll sample matrices from the posterior distribution. You'll love it. Um, does this make sense so far? Yeah? Uh, so let me give you an idea again, since I did this before. And in, in my experience, this helps people a lot to get the idea of the posterior distribution contains parabolas. This is madness, right? What does this mean? Well, let me show you what it means. It's easier to see it when we start with very little data and we gradually educate the model. So let's say with only the first 10 individuals uh, in the data set, just going in order, they all turn out to be adults. The adults are first in this data set. And um, just because of the way Nancy Howells entered them. And uh, uh, so the first 10 individuals, we, we estimate parabolas. You notice that it's pretty sure in that certain range there where the data are, and it has no idea on the other side. This is one of the things I love about Bayesian inference is this kind of like caution that it has to it in ranges where you don't have data. It's like, <laughs> look, the things just flail around and it has no idea. You get these, so you can get these very broad flat regions of predictions in combination with regions where it's confident. Uh, and you get it for free just by defining the model. Uh, now the model may be a bad one. In this case, I think it is, but as you'll see in your homework, the last homework problem does a way better job with this. Um, Add in 10 more individuals. We've got some kids now. Now it knows where the curve down. It knows that you don't get, you don't get uh, taller when you're lighter, right? It didn't know in the first part, right? Because it's just a golem. What is it now, right? And, uh, but now it, now it has some kids, and so it knows, it's pretty sure you're going to curve down. Uh, and we can add in uh, the first 50 individuals. It gets tighter yet. Uh, the first 100, the first 300. And then all 554 individuals, we've got a very tight set of parabolas. Those, that's the mean. Those, that's the expected height at each weight value. And again, if you put sigma on this, which was on the previous slide, you get the envelope of prediction around. Does it make sense? And all the operations of using link and sim are the same for this model as they were for the linear model. Because they're, they're fundamentally the same. It's just a different set of assumptions inside of them. Uh, but they're the same sort of creature, uh, the same sort of device that you're building. Yeah, question? Does the number of kids matter, or is it going to start sloping down the minute and have one potentially going down? The question was, does the number of kids matter? Yes, it does. Uh, one will start to pull it down, but it won't be so confident about how far down it should go or whether maybe it should go up, right? Uh, so as you add each one in, if you want to do these sorts of experiments, uh, you, can, you can trickle them in one at a time and keep updating it. Uh, this model will fit really rapidly, so you could do that, actually. It wouldn't be a problem. Um, okay. I'm not going to go through the cubic model in any detail, uh, just to show you how you'd specify it. Um, you could, every additional term you add to the polynomial, it could bend another way again. Uh, so you can fit pretty complicated things. And so we can imagine doing that. We can make a cubic model, add it in. Now we have a weight square, a weight cube term at the end. Another uh, uh, coefficient, B3. This also fits uh, no problem. Uh, it also makes no sense, uh, but it does fit the data very well. And uh, when I say it doesn't make any sense, what do those beta coefficients mean biologically? They don't mean anything, right? They're just, they're just coefficients, so you can't interpret them uh, in any sort of way, and that's one of the reasons not to use these. But um, that said, it's really good at, at encrypting your data. Uh, as you can see over here, this is, this is really nice now. This is the cubic function, right? It gets this little upturn uh, up here, and in the, in the really heavy individuals are a little bit taller, right? This is a cohort effect, by the way. Uh, in, in this population. It's, they're not all the same. You don't have ages on here. Age is another slice that we have if we did the full demographic analysis. But um, this fits even better than that one because it gets to turn again, whereas the parabola must go down at some point. right? And you can keep going uh, if you like and add more and more. Um, when we get to chapter six, we'll revisit these polynomials and I'll show you some really absurd things they can do. With a, There'll be a point to it other than embarrassing polynomials, but uh, it'll make some sense when we get there. Um, does this make sense? I'm very pleased with myself because I'm right on time. There's 30 seconds to go, and I'm at the what happens next week slide. It's the first time this has ever happened. Uh, I had to make jokes about doing drugs in college, but <laughs> they got me to be exactly on time. So uh, for next week, or I should say, your homework is already up online. Please turn in your current homework by midnight or around there. I'll put up the solution set tomorrow morning. Um, uh, take a look at the homework for next week. 
Um, and next week, when you come in on Tuesday, we'll start multiple regression. Multiple regression will have mainly have no new sort of theoretical concepts. We're just add more parameters, and instead I'm going to show you some tinkering and the meaning of interpreting coefficients. And the plotting gets more interesting because once you have more than one data dimension to deal with, there's more ways to plot predictions and consider them. So that's next week will be practice for the most part. The hard climb, the hard initial climb of El Capitan is over. We're going to take a little rest, right? Uh, next week and do some do some cooking on a stove and then you'll do your jog to the left where you hopefully don't fall off and die. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. I'll see you next week.